Hello, thank you for coming for this talk today. I'm sorry I can't be here and I thank uh, Dr. Sonia for organizing this event and inviting me to present. And if I wasn't in Seattle all the way across the country and today wasn't my wife's birthday, I would probably be there in person uh, sharing this highly important information with you guys and ladies. So, but without further ado, let's get cracking out. We've got a lot to talk about in one hour. So let's get started. So the title of today's talk is, is Improving Patient Outcomes and Through Identifying Common Methylation Polymorphisms. That's a, that's a lot, of, lot of stuff to cover in one hour. So we'll do my, I'll do my best and we'll hit the main points uh, pretty solidly, I hope. If there's any questions, uh, please feel free to jot them down. So I highly recommend actually getting a piece of paper out and jotting down questions you have throughout the talk and you can just um, give them to Sonia afterwards and she can compile them and email them to me and I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions that you guys have. Okay, thanks. All right, disclaimers. Um, obviously information here is not guaranteed um, and it's not used for treatment so you know just use at your own risk I do. I did a lot of research for you guys, so did my homework. So I'm, it's as accurate as can be. Uh, I do consult for Iverson Genetics, a local genetics company here in Bothell, Washington. I'm president and CEO of SeedingHealth.com and founder of MTHFR.net, and I'm not promoting any products or programs for any financial gain, um, and I'm not receiving any compensation for this talk either. Who am I? Well, I am a... <laughs> 38-year-old guy, about 6 feet 5, 200 pounds, so just because you can't see me. <laughs> but I've got my molecular biology degree from the University of Washington back in 1997. Got my doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr. And I'm licensed ND here in the state of Washington and founder of mthfr.net. I founded that a year ago now, almost, and it's been uh, going gangbusters with information and a lot of feedback from people. So and it's constantly growing in information. And I'm President and CEO of SeekingHealth.com. It's uh, our own product line. So background. So before spending my spending you know time lecturing you guys about these genetic defects and methylation, I think it's important to, to know where I'm coming from on these. So my clinical focus is environmental medicine. And if you understand environmental medicine, it looks at how the environment uh, affects our health through air, water, food, um, how we perceive the environment. You know, Bruce Lipton's really big on that. So perception of things, of you know, positive or negative uh, outcome is really important. But also chemicals in the environment, uh, pesticides, herbicides, genetically modified foods. Um, you know, what chemicals are in your room right now, and so on. Uh, nutritional biochemistry. This is a, you know, probably since I studied in. Um, Molecular biology and nutritional biochemistry is, is very, very important, especially when you're working with genetic defects. So that has always been a passion of mine since high school. Gastroenterology, you got to heal the gut. Uh, nutrigenomics, brand new field um, in medicine and expanding and growing leaps and bounds. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking a bit about today and combining all of these focuses. I've worked with tons of people with MTHFR defects and other methylation defects as well. And we all have methylation dysfunction, whether we know it or not. And I'll describe that here soon. I extensively research and compile scientific data for Medline. And when I say extensively, I mean a lot. I mean, I'm fortunate to have an excellent crew uh, running my companies. But, uh, and that allows me to spend hours and hours and hours, literally a day, combing through research and working with people one-on-one, -on -one, and I've learned a lot from doing it. So the purpose of this talk is to provide a general overview of methylation. Uh, as I understand, a lot of you guys already know about methylation, so I'm going to go through that pretty quickly. I want to expand the awareness of genetic defects which affect methylation. Now this is big, and uh, you will see why. Improving difficult patient outcomes. You know, you, if you're a patient or you have people coming into your office and they've been to all the other NDs, they've done all the standard treatments that you would have done, and you're like, oh, crap, what am I going to do for this patient? Well, after this talk, you're going to have an idea of what to do. 
um, reduce lifelong suffering of various chronic diseases and conditions by identifying genetic mutations early on. When I talk about early on, I'm talking about preconception. That's huge. So again, we've got one hour so for a week-long topic. Overview of this presentation, basic outline, what is methylation, what functions does it serve, what inhibits and supports it, the multifaceted approach to optimizing health, what basically integrative, functional, and naturopathic physicians uh, do for patients on a daily basis, but it's not multifaceted enough, and I'm going to expand uh, and add a component to this. Uh, screening for methylation testing, when and why and how to order this genetic test and various other testings, and what to do with the test results and how to work with your patient once you get these results back. So we will get into some treatment uh, recommendations here soon as well. So methylation, what is it? Well, in essence, it's the simplest uh, compound in our body, uh, and it's a process of using that compound. So methylation is the ability of donating a methyl group to a substrate, and a substrate can be you know, DNA, RNA, chemicals in our environment, chemicals in our body, such as neurotransmitters and hormones, our immune system, uh, and various cells, and our nerves. And what happens is you, know, you take a methyl group that's made, and it, if you have a sufficient amount of them, then they can perform their function when they are bound to a substrate. So, for example, you look at uracil. Uracil is an RNA base. It's very, very important. And if we lack methylation, we are not able to convert into thymine. And thymine is what is converted from uracil. And thymine is basically methyl uracil. So you can see the methyl group right there, circled in red. So that's pretty darn critical. So if we're lacking methylation, we're lacking thymine, we're lacking DNA production. Not good. Functions of methylation, big one, turning on and off genes, gene regulation. That, I think, is very important for various reasons. You know, cancer is one that we come off top of our heads, probably. Process chemicals and toxins, known as biotransformation. So we're taking a chemical or a toxin from the environment or from within our own bodies, and we're transforming it into something that's least, less harmful and also water soluble so we can eliminate this compound or making it fat soluble and storing it somewhere safe out of our bloodstream. Building neurotransmitters such as dopamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. Processing hormones, estrogen. Estrogen is uh, when it's methylated, it's broken down. So if you have lack of methylation, you've got excess estrogen. It's one, one pathway for elevated estrogen, actually. Building immune cells, T cells and NK cells, really important. DNA and RNA synthesis, as we discussed earlier, thymine comes from uracil. Producing energy, CoQ10, carnitine, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Without ATP, you're dead. CoQ10, we know how important that is. Carnitine is critical as well. So without energy, you, your muscles are really sore, and chemical processes, uh, biochemical processes are not moving forwards. And producing pr protective coatings on your nerves, known as myelination. A lot of people with uh, lack of methylation, you know, they have a lot of nerve issues. So how do you regulate methylation? You know, how do you regulate the production of methyl groups binding to substrates? Well, many enzymes are required. Um, actually, I should back up. Methylation is regulated by how much substrate is available and a functioning enzyme. And a functioning enzyme means that the enzyme is able to do work. And that in order for that enzyme to function, it needs to have cofactors to make that enzyme move forward, but it also has to not be mutated. Now, DNA produces enzymes, and if that DNA is mutated or genetically altered, then that enzyme is misshapen, and the effect of that enzyme is changing. Um, so supposedly, it may not even work at all, or it may just be reduced in capacity and function. So... As discussed, many enzymes require cofactors to be activated. What are cofactors? Vitamins and minerals. And without the cofactors, you can't complete methylation. And cofactors are required to turn off methylation as well. And if you have too much of a substrate, then methylation may turn off feedback inhibition. Not good. Or it is good in some situations as well. You don't want to have it on all the time. How is methylation disturbed? 
Methylation is often disturbed by various mechanisms. One, big one, lack of cofactors driving methylation forward. You know, common cofactors are zinc, magnesium, B6, um, medications. You know, if you're taking antacids, your B12 levels are really deficient. And if you're low on B12, methylation processes do not move forward. Specific nutrients depleting methyl groups. Niacin is a big one. Niacin utilizes a lot of SAMI, and SAMI is the main methyl donor in our body. If you take a lot of niacin, which a lot of people and a lot of naturopaths and integrative functional docs are giving niacin by the bucket load for people with high cholesterol, got to kind of rethink that, I think. If you're giving a lot of niacin for people to reduce their cardiovascular risk uh, in order to, by reducing cholesterol, are you doing them a favor? I don't think so. I think you're actually harming them. Environmental toxicity, heavy metals, chemicals, acetaldehyde from yeast, from uh, processing alcohol, arsenic, mercury, all these demand methylation to be processed. So if you're consuming alcohol or if you have yeast overgrowth or you've got arsenic in your drinking water or you're exposed to mercury from mercury amalgams or fish or what have you from the environment, all that is sucking up methyl groups and it can cause a lack of methylation. Excessive substrate, feedback inhibition. Uh, gosh, uh, for example, too much SAMe. If you have a lot of SAMe, um, you're not know, going to be producing any more of it. Um, if you're taking glutathione, that glutathione, um, you know, if you can get straight, is also going to stop production. Okay, uh, excessive cysteine also. Uh, genetic mutations, huge, huge. I mean, if you have a genetic mutation in a gene that, or in an enzyme that is supposed to create methyl donors such as SAMe, then you obviously are not going to be producing much methyl groups at all. You ever seen these conditions? Let's take a look. It's pretty big ones there. I think we see them almost every day in a clinic. Talk to your friends, family. Either you or someone you know has multiple of these. Why are all these conditions so prevalent? Well, you got to look at the industrialized farming and ranching techniques that we're having in this country and unfortunately worldwide now. That leads to poor nutrition and chemical exposure. Increased stress. Longer work hours, less sleep, more demands, faster society, iPads, I this, I that, uh, internet, you know, it's, it's insane. Chemicals everywhere, schools, home, food, water, work, you know, our kids going to parks and there's chemicals there. So you know, we've got to add on standardized health care. You know, there's so many sick people that treatments are standardized. So patient walks into a, a doctor's office, they state their symptoms, the doctor pulls out the recipe book and gives out the specific ingredients, you know, which is either surgery or medications. The underlying causes go, you know, totally dismissed. Lack of education. People do not understand that the common everyday exposures are really ruining their health. Food choices are terrible also. Lobbyists protecting big business instead of us. What do all these causal factors have in common? Again, the farming, stress, Symptomatic treatment, chemicals, pervasive in the environment. What's, what's the link here? They all consume methyl groups. That leads to decreased methylation. Decreased methylation leads to a lot of issues because, as we discussed, methylation is critical in DNA regulation, and it's critical in eliminating toxins in the environment or in our bodies, our own personal environment. It's critical in neurotransmitter production, myelination, immune support. So what do you do about all these causal factors of disease? I mean, what, as a physician or as an in, in, individual, what do you do to reduce this problem? Well, a multifaceted approach. You need to balance methylation. And good doctors do this. Good individuals do this who are educated. So the current multifaceted approach to balancing methylation is lifestyle, diet, environment, mental outlook, and nutrition. A good doctor and a person who's motivated in maintaining health and preventing disease are going to apply all of these. This approach is really demanding, requires patient education, is very difficult to achieve, 
definitely hard to maintain, takes time, but it's required. And there's no way around it. I mean, if you want to maintain, maintain health, prevent disease, you've got to do all these, one through five. And the, there's, there's no other way to do it. And if you're not motivated to do it, then you know, you're going to have to go and, and settle for the drive through medicine and take your prescription drugs and swallow some supplements, and hopefully that takes care of it. But you know, if you really want to get better and your patients better, you have to hit all of these. But it's not enough. I mean, that is still not enough, and that's that's uh, really blows my mind. When I was in school at Bastyr, it seemed like it was enough, but now with the advent of you know industrialized food, even more prevalent in our society, and the faster pace causing people to have really poor food choices, it's uh, it's not enough for a big portion of the population. So, difficult chronic disease patients are still not improving. You know, autism is on the rise like crazy. Cancer is on the rise. Uh, syndromes are on the rise. Autoimmune disease is skyrocketing. Um, you know, and these people are motivated. I mean, they come to you. They're gluten-free. They're dairy-free. They get their eight hours of sleep if they can sleep. They're trying to exercise. They're eating the purest diet possible. They're taking the highest quality supplements. They don't watch uh, bad news on TV. Um, they're, you know, doing sauna, they're doing colonics, I mean, they're doing everything, but there's something missing. Genetics. It's the missing factor now. And unfortunately, you know, we have to look at genetics in order to get these people better. Before, when methylation was balanced and we could, we could cope as individuals living in our uh, environment, we didn't need to know the genetics. But right now, the genetics is, is needed to know because methylation is totally imbalanced. So, since we know we need to look at genetics, what genes do we look for? Well, the Human Genome Project was awesome. You know, it, uh, it's told us a ton of information. And, you know, this is just a sampling of the genes. You know, as through my research, you know, I've, there's a lot more genes that I'm really interested in. You know, I work with a lot of women who have recurrent miscarriages, and there's a lot of genes I want to evaluate for that. There's people who tend to have detoxification difficulties, and I have genes for that. You know, I have, um, you know, and on. So, but the, the main ones that I'm trying to look at right now, the biggest one is MTHFR. And I chose MTHFR for a reason, which you will soon see. Um, and what I want to, I want to put a plug in here for SpectraCell. I'm not compensated for this, what have you. I just use them. But patient cost for SpectraCell is $150. That's that's quite inexpensive. For you folks in Canada, I still I do think they ship to Canada as well. Um, hopefully, you guys have somebody to 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 use. But SpectraCell so far is the best rate and best turnaround turnaround time for ordering MTHFR, and they test for both uh, common mutations for MTHFR. If you go to um, potentially other uh, labs, they will not test for the 1298. A lot of people say that 1298 is not important to test for. So, but, you know, if you're, if you're working with MTHFR, you know what you're doing. The patient's getting, uh, you know, somewhat better, but they flare. They're not getting as, as better as, as you would expect them. Then I would sit back and I would, you know, evaluate if, the, if your treatment plan is, one, appropriate for the MTHFR and, and you're working with a multifaceted approach. And if you are, and the patient is, is very compliant, then I think you need to step back and order some further testing, either genetic testing or just general lab testing. Now, other ge genetics to look at are these right here, COMT, MAO-A, CVS, MTR, GSTM1, SOD, GAD, and so on. Um, and you've probably been reading while I've been talking, uh, multitasking. Um, so, you know, these are important. And if you look at what they do, you know, COMT and MAO-A, they process neurotransmitters, uh, catabolism and estrogens. It's huge. Uh, CBS helps process homocysteine, and if it's upregulated, I mean, it's working too quickly, it's a methyl sink. It's just sucking all your methyl groups. Uh, it increases taurine and ammonia and proxynitrate. Bad news. MTR, MTRR, it utilizes uh, potentially a ton of methyl B12, um, and so you, these people are constantly low in B12. And it also helps recycle B12. So if you have these enzymes 
uh, is defective, then you understand that you need to give these people a lot more B12. GSTM1 and SOD, major detoxification enzymes. GSTM1 is the glutathione uh, enzyme in the liver. If that's defective, then you're not producing glutathione from your liver. That's pretty bad news. Uh, GAD, that's transforming glutamate to GABA. So if you're working with autistic uh, kids and even if you're addressing the MTHFR and everything else, you know, perhaps they've got a GAD issue, but GAD can also be inhibited through the environment. It doesn't have to be mutated. So you have to look at autoimmunity towards a GAD enzyme or other things which turn it off. HNMT processes histamine. Histamine can mimic a lot of chronic long-term diseases. I want to discuss that a bit today, but I didn't have time. Primary histamine um, cat, uh, enzyme, which helps break it down, is DAO. And that is also mainly inhibited through the environment, and alcohol is a big one. So, you know, you know, wine is a great example. If you give somebody red wine and they do a total flare-up, then their DAO enzyme is not functioning very well. And if you compound with the secondary enzyme for processing histamine and you have a mutation in HNMT, you've got issues. QDPR recycles BH4. BH4 is a critical component for producing neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, epinephrine, norepinephrine. Uh, NOS processes ammonia, forms nitric oxide. Uh, it's really important. And if you have too much ammonia and you're not going to be producing, you're going to have too little BH4. If you have too little BH4, you're not going to be making neurotransmitters. SUX, uh, SUX, sulfox, processes sulfites and sulfur. Um, this is uh, kind of downstream of the CBS enzyme. So if you've got a CBS upregulation and you've got a sulfox, uh, mutation, then your ability to process the sulfur and the sulfites is severely lacking, and that's going to be a big problem, especially when you try to detox somebody, because usually detox nutrients are made of sulfur, so they get worse. So complicated, and uh, so you heard all that. Now, kind of dump it from your brain for the moment, okay? Because this is, this is like the week-long lecture to go into all how these relate and interrelate. Um, so just let it go for now. It's interesting to bit that you heard, but let it go. Who to screen for MTHFR mutations? That's the partial list. I want to point out preconception care is a big one. Newborn. And I also want to point out... Uh, Recurrent miscarriages, Down syndrome. Yeah, I mean, birth defects, autism, uh, so on. Big. Okay, here we go. So who to screen? Everyone. Screen everyone. 150 bucks. You screen your patient for MTHFR. They come in. You do your intake. And you say, hey, I've been informed that this genetic mutation is extremely prevalent. It interacts everywhere in, bio, in our biochemistry. And I really want to work with you 100%. And I don't want to not know if you do not have this mutation that's so prevalent in our environment. Are you willing to invest $150 in your health to see if you have this mutation? And if you do, it could change your life and your families. Because if you have it, then your kids have it potentially, and your siblings, your mother, your father, and so on, okay? So you test everyone. And why? Why do you test the MTHFR SNP? You know, the single nucleotide uh, polymorphism, you know, basically it's a single base um, nucleotide, meaning a DNA base. Okay, so why do you check MTHFR? Well, because it's pretty darn common. We've got here... The whites in Europe and North America, one copy, up to 50% almost, have one 677 variant. And 20% upwards have two for 677. 20% are heterozygous for each one. And 12% have two copies. That's huge. Hispanics have 42% of a heterozygous 677 variant. Heterozygous meaning one copy. Homozygous meaning two copies. 
And when I say compound heterozygous, I mean one copy of each. Compounding meaning more than one, obviously. Okay, so these statistics are pretty big. Asians, 35% for one copy. And all of it, the MTHFR testing I've done, I have only seen three come back with no um, mutations at all. And I, I look at that test and say, wow, you're lucky. So this is an important point right here. Having two MTHFR variants is much more common than having high homocysteine or any health conditions linked to high homocysteine. That is coming from a pretty conservative uh, website, Atlantic Health. So MTHFR variant is not all about high homocysteine. I know a lot of you docs and individuals have said, oh, you screen MTHFR because of high homocysteine. Wrong. That's one factor. So let's keep talking about prevalence. So testing for newborns. So we've got, uh, I think, 13 different areas here. You know, I don't want to hammer this home too much, but Mexicans, again, this is prevalence of homozygous. So two copies of 677. 30-some percent of Mexicans have two copies. And this is the most severe form of MTHFR. Italians, almost 30 percent. Uh, Hispanics, you know, upwards of 30 percent. There's some outliers there. So the minimum, on average, you know, on average, if we divide this in half, we're talking about a 20 percent prevalence of this severe genetic defect of MTHFR. So one out of five of your patients are carrying this. Are you testing for it? Are you treating it? You need to be. So again, breaking the same study out a little bit more by area and ethnic origin. So, you know, the genotype here, TT, that's the mutated form, 20%, 26%, 15%. 32%, again, Mexicans, 20% Chinese, 14% Spanish, 26% Italians, and the frequency of the, the T allele, and the T allele is the mutated form in the 677 uh, location. And I should back up. On the MTHFR, there's two main, I'm going to discuss this uh, here real soon. Just wanted to show you guys the prevalence first. But uh, 677 means it denotes the position on the MTHFR uh, enzyme and the gene. So it's the same name for the enzyme and the gene. It's kind of confusing. But uh, so the position, 607, 677 position on that DNA strand for the MTHFR gene. At, at the 677 spot, there's a switch from cytosine to thymine. And at the 1298th position, you've got and adenosine switching to uh, a thymine. So, and that single base change causes shape transformation in the enzyme, and it causes uh, pretty serious uh, effects because the enzyme doesn't function very well. Okay, so it's prevalent. 57% of Mexicans have a T allele. So what does this translate to in terms of health? Well, the prevalence of neural tube defects are consistent with the prevalence of mutation. So if you look at the data for Mexicans, Northern Chinese, so they have a very high rate of the, of the homozygous T MTHFR genotype, but also very high rates of neural tube defects. So it's an alignment. In the US, neural tube defects are, very, are quite high among Hispanics, non-Hispanic whites, and lower among African Americans. So again, this is following the trend of the frequency of the 677 homozygous uh, genotype. But there are exceptions. In southern Italy, the 677 homozygous variant is also common, but the rate of neural tube defects is not. So would it, why? Well, it's environmental and nutritional factors. In southern Italy, they're probably living a pretty nice life out there on the sea. They're eating damn good foods. Their air is clean. They probably don't have all the crappy genetically modified foods that we have here, at least not yet. And, uh, you know, the, their methylation is in general okay because they're leading healthy lifestyles. And healthy lifestyles is important. It's, it's critical. So I wanted to point that out. And, you know, I think it's a really important point.
So, the MTHFR variants and their effects. So, as discussed, the MTHFR 677 variant and the 1298 variant are the two most common. There are some, there's like 40 others, but labs don't check those, um, you know, and I, I haven't studied them because labs don't test for them, so why bother? Um, so, one thing they should know of, uh, know about is the 677 is synonymous with the A222V and the RS180-1133. And the 1298 is also synonymous with the 429A and that other RS number. Okay, so if you see those, it's the same thing. So MTFR 677, really related to cardiovascular issues, homocysteine, blood clotting, uh, pulmonary thromboses, uh, DNA regulations, uh, glutathione production is a big one, low methylfolate levels, which you'll soon see why. Um, if you have one copy, so one uh, base change, at position 677 uh, to a thymine, you've got 40% loss of function and your MTHFR enzyme. So that means you're making 40% less methylfolate. And if you have two copies, you've got 70% loss of function, which means you're only making a third of the methylfolate that you should be making. And the basis switches, again, the cytosine switch to thymine. And wild type, wild type meaning what's natural in the environment, uh, and from generation to generation, the bulk of the population is the wild type, and that's the cytosine. And you're supposed to have two copies of, of the cytosines at position 677. 1298s, this is a pretty controversial um, variant in MGHFR. And, you know, the research, if you look at the research, there is definitely linkages with the MGHFR 1298 defect, but, um, you know, trying to find a biochemical explanation of how 1298 defect is, you know, working is, is, is hard to find. But it seems that it's linked to biopterin. And, you know, if you look at the wheels of MTHFR, which you will soon see, um, methylfolate feeds into biopterin, which is BH4. So you typically have neurological issues, neurotransmitter problems, uh, pain, nitric oxide, uh, elevations, peroxynitrate elevations, and you've got potentially low BH4 levels, but you should be uh, producing your methylfolate okay. So that's the weird part about it. It's the 677 does um, cause definitely a reduction in methylfolate. The 1298, supposedly not. And I am starting to now test the 1298s for methylfolate levels to see if this is accurate or inaccurate. Um, I'm suspecting that the 1298 individuals um, are going to have some uh, deficiency in methylfolate. Again, the adenine is the normal type in um, the 1298 position on the MTFR gene and the wild type. The majority of the population has two adenines in their DNA. So here's a crazy graph, and we're going to talk right now about 677 and how it's linked to numerous conditions. So if you look at this, you look at folic acid way at the top. Now, folic acid, this is absolutely synthetic. It's in supplements and fortified foods. It's not in your diet unless you're, you know, you're eating. It's not in your natural food diet, I should say. It's, it's enriched um, by companies. The dietary folate is one step down, and that's the dihydrofolate uh, enzyme. So, and, or gene, rather. Or, no, dihydrofolate is the nutrient. The dihydrofolate reductase processes the folic acid into dihydrofolate, and that enzymatic process is slow. So if you're eating a bunch of enriched foods and the DHFR enzyme is slow, then you're making high amounts of unmetabolized folic acid, and unmetabolized folic acid is not good. It actually has been shown to decrease natural killer cells, and I think that is partially the reason why Important point here, if you're zoning out, important point, I want to reiterate, important point of why folic acid can cause cancer in individuals is elevations in unmetabolized folic acid due to the highly prevalent uh, enriched folic acid supplementation in our foods and everywhere in our supplements and the prevalence of the MTH of our mutation as well, leading to unmetabolized folic acid is causing elevations of this uh, marker and it's increasing the deficiency of natural killer cells and NK cells are critical 
and fighting uh, little tiny cancer cells. So again, I think that's how folic acid partially is contributing to increased cancer rates. So and if you look down this chain, so folic acid goes to dihydrofolate, then it goes to tetrahydrofolate, then it goes to 10-formal tetrahydrofolate, then that moves over to purine synthesis and makes uh, further bases, you know, for your DNA and RNA, and then that goes down to 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate, which moves into 5-formal, and 5-formal is folinic acid. So folinic acid is also called leucobarin, and a lot of doctors will prescribe high-dose folic acid or high-dose leucoborin or folinic acid for their MTHFR patients. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, you do need folinic acid. Um, you can get that from your foods because if you see here, dietary folate will move forward uh, down the reaction quite well and make uh, folinic acid. So I don't think giving high-dose folic acid to those with MTHFR is a good idea because you're increasing your metabolized folic acid levels. So the end result right here, as you just saw that, is the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. And that is coming from uncooked leafy greens. And so if you're eating a diet in uncooked leafy greens, which I think those in southern Italy are doing, you know, it's a brilliant environment for growing veggies, and they're not, uh, you know, they don't have the phenotypic expression of the MTHFR defect because they're getting plenty of methylfolate, so they're bypassing the mutation. And other nutrients that are necessary to produce methylfolate if you are not getting your uncooked leafy greens is riboflavin and vitamin B6. If you don't have either of those, then you're not producing your methyl tetrahydrofolate. And we're assuming right now that you have a fully functioning MTHFR enzyme. If you have a fully functioning MTHFR enzyme and you're lacking B2 and B6, then you're not going to be producing much methylfolate. And if you add on the fact that you've got the MTHFR defect, you're really not producing much methylfolate. So what happens? Say you, you are taking your methylfolate. You do have adequate B12 or B2. You do have adequate B6 and you're either addressing the MTHFR enzyme through eating uncooked leafy greens or supplementing with methylfolate, but you're not taking any methylcobalamin. Well, you're going to get methyl trapping. Why? Because low B12 status blocks uh, the ability for methylfolate to methylate cobalamin, and that methylation of cobalamin produces methylcobalamin, which then moves the cycle forward to producing SAME. And if you do not have the cobalamin there, then that methyl group from 5-methyltetrahydrofolate does not get used at all. So and if you look at where 5-methyltetrahydrofolate goes according to the arrow here, it, it swings along, it donates the methyl group to B12, and then it converts back into tetrahydrofolate. So the methyl group has been gone. But again, if you do not have adequate cobalamin, you cannot donate that methyl group from methylfolate. So you do not get any benefit. So doctors who just give high doses of Deplin or high doses of methylfolate and they're not giving methylcobalamin to their patients or their hydroxycobalamin or some form of cobalamin, then they may just be increasing the levels of 5-methyltetrahydrofolate and not getting any result with their patients. And as discussed, unmetabolized folic acid levels are not good. Uh, if they're too high, you're reducing your natural killer cells. And that's in the research. There's quite a bit of research, actually, on unmetabolized folic acid. Recommend it. And there's a test by Metametrics, which does test for unmetabolized folic acid levels. So that's a good test to look at. MTHFR-1298. So oh, I should go back. One second. So, so say we, we do have enough methylfolate. You are supplementing with B12. The reaction proceeds forward. You're making your methionine, and then you're producing SAME. SAME is your main carbon, single carbon donor. So that is where most of your methylation is coming from, and it starts with MTHFR. So if you're taking your methylfolate and your methylcobalamin 
and you're eating dark leafy greens and you got your B6 and your B2 from your supplements or what have you, then you can produce your SAMe. But SAMe cofactor for that is magnesium and ATP. So if you're working with you know, individuals and they still have low SAMe, it could be because they have low magnesium. So, you know, but you're seeing, you're starting to see how important it is that where methylfolate is right here on the graph. And that's critical. MTGFR enzyme is in a bad place if it's not working. And so you're going to want to fix that. And so the SAMe continues down to produce homocysteine and homocysteine then gets converted into glutathione. So methylfolate indirectly increases glutathione levels, so it increases biotransformation. So that's also critical, right? And then you've got um, methylation of DNA regulation. Methylation contributing to DNA regulation through SAMe and methionine. So as you see here on the graph. So it's critical. So let's discuss 1298. So 1298 commonly seen to mental dysfunction addictions and various syndromes like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. I see that uh, quite often in my clients, and they also have a lot of neurological problems, you know, burning, paresthesias, um, just weird um, neurological issues. And that is stemming from, I believe, deficiency in, in uh, tetrahydrobiopterin. And if you're looking at the conversion from BH2 to BH4 here on the graph, that's done by this enzyme here, the dihydrofolate reductase enzyme. And that requires methylfolate. And if methylfolate is lacking, the conversion from BH2 to BH4 does not happen. And what happens? Big deal. What happens from, from if you have too little BH4? Well, you are not making dopamine because you're supposed to, BH4 helps convert tyrosine into dopamine. It helps convert tryptophan into serotonin. It helps convert arginine into nitric oxide and citrulline. And that's pretty huge. So there's your dopamine that's made from BH4. It's your serotonin made from BH4. There's your nitric oxide made from BH4. And remember, BH4 is partially made from methylfolate from the conversion from BH2. So what happens if you have a COMT mutation? The COMT, COMT mutation is, uh, I think it's a cystathionine O-methyltransferase or catecholamine O-methyltransferase. I think I'm botching that a bit, but COMT we'll call it. And if you have that enzymatic defect, you are not going to be breaking down dopamine levels. So you're going to have potentially increased dopamine levels. So if you are supplementing an individual with a lot of methylfolate, you have a potential to increase a lot of dopamine in individuals who have the COMT mutation. The MAO-A enzyme, if it's defective, you're not going to be breaking down serotonin. So that seems kind of counterintuitive, I know, but if, if the MAO-A, the function of MAO-A and the function of COMT is to break down dopamine and serotonin. If they are mutated, these break down a lot slower, leading to elevations of dopamine and serotonin. Why is that a big deal? Maybe that's a good thing, right? I mean, if you have a deficiency in dopamine and serotonin because you're lacking methylfolate due to an MTHFR enzyme defect, that's a good thing. But if you're a doctor and you're prescribing high amounts of methylfolate to your patient, and you have an unknowing uh, COMT and MAO-A enzyme lurking in your patient's uh, biochemistry, you can set them off. Why? Because dopamine converts into norepinephrine and epinephrine. So you're going to increase the sympathetic nervous system, and you're going to get a lot of anxiety. You're going to get heart palpitations. You're going to get totally pissed off patients breaking things. I, I work with kids who have done, literally done thousands of dollars of damage to their parents' cars after they come back from their doctor prescribing their kids two and a half milligrams of methylfolate or folinic acid. And this is why uh, they have a COMT mutation. I see it all the time. So it's a very prevalent mutation. So methylfolate and BH4. A lot of diagrams are showing that folinic acid is required for this step. 
So, and from my experience, working with people, uh, they get the biggest effect in their moods from supplementing with methylfolate, not folinic acid. Again, that's leucovorin also. So, and if you want to increase the blood levels of methyl tetrahydrofolate, you need quite a bit more um, folic acid to do that, and you don't want to do that because you're increasing unmetabolized folic acid, which decreases natural killer cells. You want to go straight to the source, either uncook leafy greens or you go right to methylfolate supplements. So folic acid may be able to convert this, uh, and it definitely can in individuals who do not have an MTHFR enzyme uh, defect. That's totally fine. Um, but if they have, if you're working with a population with mood disorders uh, or neurotransmitter deficiencies or dysfunction, then supplementing with uh, methylfolate is probably what you want to do. So the importance, again, of 1298-BH4 is just another way to look at it. So if you look at tyrosine up here on the top, I kept it big so you guys can see it. So tyrosine is at the top, and then you've got a cofactor of BH4 uh, working on the tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme. So again, we talked about methylation requiring cofactors. And again, we've got tetrahydrobiopterin. And you know we're not showing, I did not draw in the methylfolate um, in here, but it should be. So you got your tetrahydrobiopterin working with L-tyrosine to make dopamine, and then it goes on forwards to make norepinephrine and epinephrine. And it's interesting to note here, if you look at other cofactors, you know, going from dopamine to norepi, you've got um, vitamin C as a cofactor to convert dopamine to norepinephrine. And then you've got SAM, uh, SAMI, to convert norepi to epi. So you need to methylate norepinephrine in order to make epinephrine. So that's also interesting. And it's critically important uh, line of neurotransmitters. I mean, dopamine, norepi, epi, and then serotonin is not shown here. So, okay. If you got no methylfolate, you've got potentially low BH4, you've got deficiency in various neurotransmitters, especially if you've got uh, low vitamin C and low SAM. And remember that methylfolate produces SAMI uh, through the MTHFR677 side, as we discussed earlier. And you can see it here also. So MTHFR is more than elevated homocysteine. A lot of research is saying that MTHFR is only homocysteine. Well, I've just shown you that it's critical for glutathione production. It's critical for DNA regulation and RNA regulation. It's critical for making DNA and RNA bases. It's important for uh, neurotransmitter production. And why? I mean, why? what if your patient has an MTHFR enzyme defect and they have normal homocysteine? How can that be? You know, you, you tell your patient, oh, I'm sorry, you know, we don't need to do anything for your MTHFR defect because your, your homocysteine levels are good. In fact, they may be even low. And if they're low, you got to suspect a CBS mutation. Now, that's a plug. If homocysteine levels are low, in your patient, you have to suspect excessive B6 supplementation and or a CBS mutation. If that's the case, then uh, you need to evaluate that, and that's beyond the scope of this talk. So how do you lower homocysteine? There's four ways to do it. Vitamin B6 goes to the cystothionine um, enzyme, cystothionine beta synthase to be exact. It's one way to lower it. And actually, that's a great way to lower it because uh, homocysteine, if you convert it through B6, that will actually produce glutathione, and that's not shown here, um, which I should have drawn in. But homocysteine conversion through the cystothionine beta synthase uh, with vitamin B6 will produce glutathione. So that's a good way to, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Another way, methylcobalamin. The circle goes to the right. Uh, homocysteine um, will transform, actually it goes up, upwards, sorry, to methionine. Homocysteine, with the help of methylcobalamin, turns into methionine. If you do not have methylfolate, uh, it doesn't really matter because as long as you have methylcobalamin on hand, you can lower um, homocysteine levels directly with methylcobalamin. A big one, huge one, is betaine. Betaine bypasses the whole wheels. You go right up from homocysteine straight up to methionine with betaine. And there's a lot of research showing how effective this is. So you definitely do not want to supplement with DMG 
because that's what we talked about, feedback inhibition. So if you are giving DMG instead of TMG, now betaine, there may be some confusion. Betaine, there's hydrochloric acid, so betaine HCL, so you typically give to patients who have stomach, uh, low stomach acid, right? So they're belching and what have you. So you give them betaine HCL. So you can do that. Um, if they got digestive problems, they'll get some betaine. That's fine. But the typically, you know, people, you know, you don't want to give hydrochloric acid to people because then it, again, it's feedback inhibition. Their body will not make their own vitamin or hydrochloric acid. So I don't recommend it uh, long term. So I typically give, um, you know, digestive bitters. Uh, you know, gentiana is a great one. You know, just drop or two of that in the mouth and boy, their digestion's moving. So I give betaine anhydrous or TMG, trimethylglycine. So that's what I try to use to lower homocysteine levels and I will see elevated homocysteine. Uh, and by the way, beets are very high in betaine. So, you know, if people want to get a lot of betaine from their food, uh, beets are a great way to do that. Um, and that's great for people who are really sensitive to supplementation. So get some beets in them, the whole thing. You can juice it too, but give them the fiber as well. And if you give the DMG, you are going to um, inhibit the conversion from homocysteine to methionine. Um, and you're, that way you're going to increase homocysteine levels. So be careful with DMG. Riboflavin is another way to lower homocysteine. Uh, because if you have inadequate levels of uh, riboflavin, then you're not going to be making 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, which is the where the MTHFR enzyme is. So just I put that in because if you're supplementing with methylfolate and your patient's not getting better, you know, and you're probably just giving Deplin or just methylfolate, you know, you've got to deal with your riboflavin, your B12, your B6, and your betaine, and uh, that's then they'll start lowering their homocysteine very rapidly. Additional labs to consider for those with MTHFR defects. Now, this is a laundry list, um, but it's something to think of. And for those patients who are not getting better with your standard treatment protocol, which I will get into here soon, uh, functional lab testing is, is very useful um, for you to not get burned out and so your patient doesn't uh, become a lab rat and experiment it on. So vitamin diagnostics, uh, they're a new lab that I'm working with. Um, they're kind of funky, but uh, they have the only test that I've seen that measures the markers that I want to see. So histamine is really important. Uh, elevated homocysteine is directly tied to methylation dysfunction. So it's an easy way to see if your uh, patient is over or under methylated. Histamine levels are too low. They're uh, over methylated. If they're too high, then they're under methylated. Biopterin and neopterin, it's great to see how BH4 is doing. If neopterin levels are too high due to uh, infection or inflammation, that uh, can inhibit biopterin. So you've got to get the inflammation down and you've got to um, combat the infection. And typically you can combat infection by producing immune cells. And that is done by, yes, methylfolate. So methylmalonic acid, look at uh, B12 levels on metabolic folic acid to make sure you're not increasing cancer risk. Folic acid to make sure that your patients are not eating a lot of enriched foods or taking any more folic acid supplements. I highly encourage all folic acid supplements to be stopped um, and to only supplement with folinic acid, either leucovorin or nature folate or uh, methylfolate. And combining a combina combination of folinic acid and methylfolate is a good idea. Um, and again, you can test for that. 5-methylfolate, ammonia levels. Um, you know, if ammonia levels is commonly high in those with CBS mutations, um, it's also high in those with inadequate BH4 and biopterin. And if ammonia is high, then they're not producing neurotransmitters that they need to produce because um, the body preferentially uh, eliminates ammonia before it makes neurotransmitters. Uh, nitrotyrosine, that's a marker, a more stable marker for prox proxy nitrate. Uh, proxy nitrate. Uh, is commonly elevated in those with low BH4 and elevated ammonia, and that's a hell of a uh, metabolite. It can cause a lot of destruction on the nerves, so you've got to get that down. Um, nitric oxide, if it's elevated um, out of normal, it can wreak havoc and cause inflammation. Um, 
and leakiness, you know, nitric oxide elevation is actually what is very high in sepsis. Um, and that's why some people can go into shock and fall over. Um, it's because their nitric oxide levels are so high. So you don't want them high. You want them balanced. Uh, glutathione, reduced and oxidized. Um, you know, you definitely want to have a balance there. So you don't want to have too much oxidized glutathione. You want to have it available and ready to work. Uh, I don't like supplementing directly with glutathione directly or commonly because um, it works by feedback inhibition and you can shut down potentially the CBS pathway um, and lowering homocysteine through that route. So giving cysteine and B6 and um, you know selenium and vitamin C is a good way to go about um, supplementing or producing increased levels of glutathione. If you have to give glutathione, um, start really slowly really slowly. SAMe um, is a great supplement to give directly and people who are really ill because um, you saw how many things are required to make SAMe um, even if the MTHFR uh, defect is addressed. You know you've got uh, B12, methylcobalamin and you've got ATP um, which they should have in some form. You've got magnesium um, and uh, so if you just give SAMe sometimes that's just an easy way to go about it but it's very expensive. Uh, SAW is S adenosyl homocysteine, and SAW is a pretty unstable metabolite. Um, it's one step down, um, or one step before homocysteine, and uh, some labs and quite a bit of research actually is saying that is the prefer preferred marker for evaluating for elevated levels of quote-unquote homocysteine. So checking SAW is more accurate than checking homocysteine if you definitely want to look at your homocysteine levels in your patient. Uh, homocysteine, obviously, check urea breath test. Uh, H. pylori is extremely common, and if it's common, you got to nip it in the butt, um, and you know you got to treat it because uh, a lot of people with MTHFR have um, H. pylori. It's just super common. Uh, CDSA, you got to check their digestive um, abilities because if their gut isn't working very well, again, the multifaceted approach, you got to fix their gut probiotics, leaky gut, uh, IgAs, uh, you know, pancreatic digestive enzymes, and so on. Uh, minerals, um, evaluating minerals is important. I don't like hair analysis. I think it's bogus. Um, you know, I think uh, evaluating minerals via urine or blood are, are more accurate. Uh, pyrrolurea um, is something to, to look at, um, you know, because there's a lot of mental disorders here, so really um, low levels of zinc and vitamin B6 maybe maybe there and pyrrolurea might be the cause. Uh, basic CBC with Kempenil. Um, keeping an eye on the potassium, especially during treatment, is something important because low potassium can trigger a lot of side effects when you're supplementing with methylfolate or detoxing. Common lab values often seen with MTHFR. Uh, you've got elevated histamine, low biopterin, elevated neopterin, uh, elevated methylmalonic acid, at times, sometimes normal. Um, elevated folic acid because they're not processing it. Um, elevated folinic acid again because they're not processing it. Uh, low folinic or low methylfolate because they're not able to make it. Uh, elevated ammonia potentially due to low methylfolate or a CBS mutation or low B6 or perhaps you're giving or eating too much protein. Um, normal high taurosine. Um, again, you've got uh, potential CBS mutation there. Elevated nitrotyrosine, uh, you've got uh, probably low BH4 or elevated ammonia. Elevated nitric oxide, again, low BH4 and elevated ammonia. Low glutathione, uh, you probably got low B6 or you're, um, they're just using it all up because they're toxic. Or they've got a potential uh, GSTM1 mutation in their liver uh, or they don't are not supplementing with the precursor for glutathione um, or their methylcobalamin levels are low even if you're supplementing with methylfolate um, because in order to go to glutathione you gotta you gotta get over to SAME right uh, low SAME um, low methylfolate low methylcobalamin uh, low magnesium levels normal elevated saw um, and elevated homocysteine urea breath test metsol is a lab that uh, I've started to use and it's very easy to, to send samples to. Um, you know, have tests sent to your patients or given out to your patients and have the, the urea breath test taken. They also test for SIBO. 
um, which is great, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, problems with your CDSA is pretty darn common. Uh, decreased serotonin levels, um, dopamine levels, histidine, and Big Lou. Big Lou is a marker for uh, a lack of folic acid, and histidine is also a marker for lack of folic acid. Homocysteine lab test prep. So if you have a high homocysteine coming in from a lab, then you need to ask your patient, was it done properly? if it's the first time you've seen them. Most homocysteine that I've worked with in the past has not been accurately done. And the American Pathology Association is pretty critical on how it should be tested for. So I'm going into it right now. You cannot do home, home homocysteine tests. If your patient comes in and says, hey, I ordered this test online to test my homocysteine. It was 23. Um, is that bad? It's like, well, it's inaccurate. Bad or not, it's inaccurate. Got to redo it. High methionine foods can falsely, falsely elevate homocysteine because remember methionine converts into uh, eventually down into homocysteine. So you want to limit proteins a bit before uh, the homocysteine chest is done. You want to fast your patient for 12 hours prior to having the blood drawn. You want to schedule the blood draw in the morning so after they're fasting they can get some food in them because you're dealing with a highly sensitive population who already have issues with neurotransmitter defects. And if they're lacking protein, then they're going to crash and become all crazy on you. So make sure that you tell them to go to the blood draw center with some granola bar or some protein or hummus or something or go out to breakfast right after they get their blood drawn. Um, so get their blood drawn. The lab tech must put the sample on ice immediately or spin out the red blood cells. The red blood cells will continue to make homocysteine if they're not removed. So you got to spin it out. And once you spin out the red blood cells, you don't have to put the sample on ice anymore. It's stable for a few days. Just get it in the mail and send it to the lab. Drugs to avoid with MTHFR defects. It's a list. Just look at this list. I don't want to get into it too much here, but um, antacids obviously deplete uh, methyl groups. Cholestyramine, um, commonly given when gallbladder issues during pregnancy, can deplete cobalamin and folate absorption. Uh, not to mention uh, vitamin A and D and E um, and vitamin K because you know, it just gives them the runs. Um, cholestipol, um, same same issue, decreases fat absorption. Um, methotrexate inhibits the DHFR enzyme, which is way near the top in the folic acid metabolism. So, you know, if cancer patients on methotrexate, it's, there's research out there that, you know, it's talking about methotrexate you know, eliminating, uh, reducing methylation um, and DNA uh, regulation because of of uh, the cancer cells growing so quickly. But is that a short-term benefit to a long-term problem? Because now you've decreased methylation all during that time during cancer treatment, and now are you have you set up? Um, you know, mo low methylation for so long that you've got other cancer cells on the rise because you've now got other DNA uh, proliferating like crazy because it wasn't regulated due to lack of methylation. It's all a balance. Nitrous oxide, this uh, is an anesthesia commonly used in dental offices. So if you have patients with MTHFR, do not let them use nitrous oxide. Um, you've got to give them uh, lots of methylcobalamin and methionine and perhaps even some SAMe and methylfolate before they get in there. Um, but even if they, even if they are supplementing with that, um, don't use nitrous oxide. Uh, if they do happen to get nitrous oxide and they and you get a call from them and say, "I just got from the dentist. I feel like crap. Uh, their homocysteine is through the roof because the methionine synthase enzyme is is shot." So get them on some um, homocysteine lowering nutrients. So methylcobalamin, methylfolate, betaine, TNG. Niacin. Uh, niacin isn't a drug, but it's becoming a drug um, because it's used so much um, in people with blood clotting disorders um, or uh, uh, high cholesterol. So it depletes SAMe. So, you know, it's useful during times of overmethylation if you give somebody too much methylfolate, but I'll get into that later. Um, cyclosporin, uh, bad news. Uh, metformin, <laughs> that's really used. So we're decreasing methylation 
in patients who have methylation defects bad. I mean, you, you've got endometriosis, you've got uh, PCOS, you've got um, diabetes. All these are really uh, utilizing methylation immensely, and all these patients are taking metformin. So you got to get them on insulin um, or some other change your diet, lifestyle, and what for, what have you, but switch them to insulin, get them off metformin. Uh, phenytoin, uh, antisurgent seizure med, um, bad news. Um, carbazim, car, carbamazepine, my God, can't pronounce that one. Um, also anti-seizure, I believe. Uh, could be wrong on that one. Oral contraceptives. Uh, how many women that you know are having recurrent miscarriages and they find out they have MTHFR, and they've been on contraception or contraception for so long. Well, and how many women do you know actually supplement with folic acid for months at a time after removing the oral contraceptive pill? You know, a lot of them just get pregnant right away. You're off the pill, you get pregnant, and they think they're fine. They're not fine. So oral contraception is not a good deal. Um, it increases blood clot risk, um, you know, due to elevated estrogens, and it's also decreasing uh, methylation in a big way. Antimalarials, uh, there's three of them here. Antibiotics, um, you know, trimethoprim and Pactrim. Alcohol, uh, that's a drug. Um, and uh, sulfasalazine and triamtrin um, also inhibit uh, methylfolate way up high. Common meds used for methyl tetrahydrofolate. Well, serifolin, Nevo, serifolin NAC, Nevo DHA, Metanex. I like Metanex. It's got the most active nutrients. It's got the methylcobalamin. It's got the pyridoxal 5-phosphate. And it's got the methylfolate in the good form, um, you know, metafolin made by Merck. It's fantastic. Deplin, it's just pure methylfolate. Um, Fulby, crap. Fulplex, crap. Fulgard, crap. Fultex, crap. And Fab, crap. Um, so any of those Fs, <laughs> they're bad. Throw them in the garbage. Um, so serifolin, serifolin, NAC, Nevo, Nevo, DHA, Metanex, and Deplin are the more effective forms of meds used. Um, any of the Fs, I would throw in the trash and switch your patient off. They're very expensive, these medications, really expensive. Um, they provide powerhouse amounts of P5P and methylfolate and methylcobalamin, most of them. Deplin is just pure 7.5 milligram to 15 milligrams of methylfolate, which is a ton. Uh, it scares the heck out of me that much. Uh, perhaps if you have cerebral folate antibodies, um, you know, Deplin can come in very useful. And on a side note, uh, there's research out there that cerebral folate antibodies uh, go away on a dairy-free diet. So look at that. It's in research. So if you type in cerebral folate antibodies in milk uh, in Medline, you are, will see that research pop up. And I think that's really interesting. Um, so get your parents, patients off of dairy and then they will hopefully won't need so much uh, methylfolate. So the common other ingredients in MTHFR meds, it's a laundry list. So you need to be a damn good methylator to get rid of this crap. I mean, look at this. You know, you've got titanium dioxide. You've got one, two, like three food colorings. Uh, you know, then you've got uh, magnesium stearate in there that's reducing absorption. And these people already have uh, reduced absorption capability already. Um, so polyglycol, uh, it's just, why? Why? I, I don't get it. So I'm not happy with any meds, to be short and frank with you guys at MTH Bar. Now, you've got methylfolate over the counter, um, you know, by various supplement companies. And which methylfolate to use? If you look at all the supplement companies, it gets kind of confusing. You've got methylfolate, you've got MTHFF, MTHF, you've got methylfolate, you've got L-methylfolate, you've got 6S-methylfolate, you've got 5-methylfolate, um, you've got L5-methylfolate, you've got crotrifolic, metafolin, um, you know, calcium form, glucosamine forms. What, what does all this mean? I can simplify it very easily for you guys. I'm going to do that. Take home message is you've got to have the L in front of methylfolate. If the supplement does not have an L 
or a 6S or quadrifolic or metafolin on the label, stay away from it. Okay? It's got to have an L, a 6S. It's got to say quadrifolic or metafolin. It doesn't have to say all of them. It's got to say one of them. Okay? And the reason is because there's a racemic form of methylfolate. And that R form inhibits the absorption of the L form. So if you're supplementing with supplements claiming to have 10 milligrams of methylfolate, and you know, it's called MTHF, MTHF or 5-MTHF on the label, but it doesn't say L, don't pick it up. I'm not going to name names of supplement companies. It's not what I'm here for um, to point fingers. Do your own homework. Just look at the supplement bottle. And these are some from very reputable companies, very reputable. If it does not have L on it, put it back. Stop it. And why is that? If you pick up a 10 milligram supplement and it's claiming to have 10 milligrams of methylfolate in it as L form, wrong. They're lying or they've mislabeled it accidentally because they were unaware. But Merck and the makers of metafolin and Gnosis the makers of Quatrifolic are legally bound to have a maximum of a thousand micrograms per single serving of methylfolate of L-methylfolate in a in a simple formula of L-methylfolate. Now, if there's other ingredients such as methyl of uh, methylcobalamin or P5P or betaine or B2, they are only allowed to have a maximum of 800 micrograms per serving. Now, that's per serving, so you can always take more if you want. But I'm just warning you guys that if you want your patients to not get racemic forms and inhibit their absorption of L-methylfolate, you've got to look at the bottle. Okay, I think I made my point here. So what supplements to use for MTHFR? It's kind of a laundry list, but, uh, you know, it, it's not too bad. Um, L-methylfolate, again, sublingual methylcobalamin and or hydroxycobalamin. Uh, I say and or. Uh, I prefer methylcobalamin up front. Uh, it's definitely more effective. Hydroxycobalamin is useful for people who are overmethylated. And why is that? Um, and when I say overmethylated, they have their low histamine. Um, so if you're their low histamine, then you don't, you don't want to further methylate histamine because it's going to make it even lower. So you can give them hydroxycobalamin. And the reason why hydroxycobalamin works is because hydroxycobalamin has to be methylated from by uh, methylcobalamin. So you've got methylfolate producing methylcobalamin, and methylcobalamin then proceeds to methylate hydroxycobalamin, or some type of methyl group can uh, methylate hydroxycobalamin. So it, the summary is here that hydroxycobalamin requires methylation to be made. So if you've got a, somebody who's a low methylator and elevated homocysteine, you don't want to use hydroxycobalamin. They're not going to get benefit. You want them on methylcobalamin. Okay. Vitamin E, really important in the 677 variants. Krill oil. I use krill oil because it, uh, I find, um, you know, just from research that krill oil, since it's in the phospholipids, uh, it crosses the blood-brain barrier more effectively than fish oil. Um, fish oil is great for you know, just around the general circulation in the body. But krill oil is great for crossing the blood-brain barrier. Um, it also has astaxanthin, which is a fantastic uh, antioxidant, um, which is useful uh, in these people. Um, Silymarin, um, milk thistle, is fantastic. Selenium to make glutathione. Zinc, countless cofactors. Um, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a critical cofactor in countless enzymatic uh, processes and methylation processes. NAC and MSM and SAMe, methionine, inositol, TMG, CoQ10, ALA, carnitine, ribose. These are specialty nutrients. Um, you probably saw there a lot of mitochondrial support. Um, you know, I use quite a bit of mitochondrial support um, for people who have a lot of muscle pain. But if you give methylfolate, methylcobalamin, um, and magnesium, you do not have to give these specialty nutrients uh, typically. Um, and you got to be careful with methionine. It can increase homocysteine, especially if you're not giving methylcobalamin um, or B6. Um, glutathione, again, you got to be careful with glutathione. You got to start really small 
and you can cause feedback inhibition um, and um, in that cystathionine or um, beta synthase uh, enzyme. So be careful with that. So try not to use glutathione directly. Try to make it yourself um, or have your patient make it themselves with selenium, NAC, uh, zinc, and cysteine. And I'm missing some. Uh, probiotics, critical. Got to have gut health um, to absorb the toxins in the gut and to support IgA uh, and to reduce um, the acetaldehyde. And basically, you're, you're, sa it's, you're saving methylation big time by having a healthy gut. That's why it's so important to have a healthy gut before you even start treating MTHFR. And I'm going to get into that here soon. Uh, multivitamin with minerals and complete Bs. If your patient can handle it, I typically don't start people uh, on multivitamins right away um, just because they're pretty darn sick. Uh, D3, you want it up in the 45 to 50 range. Um, so supplementing with 5,000 units a day during non-sunny months with no sunscreen uh, during sunny months um, is to get them on there. VitaminDCouncil.org with Dr. Kennel. He has lots of research supporting the levels of vitamin D3 being about 45 to 50. Not getting into that beyond this, that point comment. Uh, vitamin C, critical, as you saw, as a cofactor um, and uh, also helps your cyclobuthione. Uh, electrolytes, absolutely. A lot of these people have adrenal fatigue and they're depleting electrolytes like crazy uh, for frequent urination. Um, so get them on electrolytes, a really good one. Elite uh, Body Bio is a fantastic electrolyte mix. I have great success for that one. Uh, magnesium, use good forms, magnesium oxide, uh, carbonate, um, garbage, don't use it. Adaptogens, ashwagandha, lifesaver. It's, uh, it's very subtle in how it works, but very effective. Digestive repair, absolutely. Potassium, critical. Um, it's a very good neutralizer of side effects. Starting MTHFR protocol. Oh, man, I how much time have I got here? I don't know. I didn't try myself. Bad. All right, speeding up. Starting your MTHFR protocol, you've got to start with history, um, your lifestyle and diet. You've got to start with foundational health first. Uh, if not, you're going to get side effects. So we talked about, we, talked, we discussed multifaceted approach. You've got to deal with the lifestyle, the diet, the sleep, the mental outlook. Obviously, all these are hard to do when your genetics are all fouled up, but do everything that you can. You've got to start with the lifestyle and the diet. Um, got to have their bowels moving, got to have their digestion going so they can absorb the nutrients. Why give them nutrients if they can't absorb it? Some believe well, methylfolate and methylcobalamin is where I typically start people um, to get them going. And probiotics like crazy, um, ramping up on those and eliminating uh, their diet, changing their diet radically um, right to a GAPS or paleo style. I have them read a book by Rob Wolf, so I don't have to educate them on it. Um, the Paleo Solution by Rob Wolf is pretty good. Lauren Cordain has some pretty uh, meaty books on the scientific aspect, but hard for people to read. Um, bowel moves, you got to get them going. Meds, uh, look for the folic acid antagonists. All right, get them off of it, switch them, talk to their doctor to switch them out. Um, supplements, which ones are making them worse? Is there folic acid in there? Um, they've got uh, a lot of niacin. You know, get them on something else. Are they eating? If they're eating, how are they eating? Are they chewing or are they being a snake? Testing. I don't test out of the gate. I, there's so many, so much foundational work done that needs to get done initially. I don't do testing right off the bat, except for MTHFR. Um, I do that first. So which MTHFR mutation is present? You've got a homozygous 677 denoted by the 677TT. You see that in research sometimes if it's, you know, the, the bases are after, so the TT meaning the the uh, the variant, the defective variants, TT. The C is the normal variant uh, in 677 position. The C is the abnormal variant in the 1298. The A, A base is the normal variant in 1298, as we discussed earlier. So I start everybody on sublingual methylcobalamin across the board. You know, if they're on nine million supplements, uh, I work with their doctor typically and I wean them off almost everything except for the ones they absolutely are committed to seeing how they are doing and I restart them. I, I basically restart them. I literally restart them. Sometimes I'll even put them on a juice diet for a couple days uh, with a good pure protein powder that's hypoallergenic with rice protein and pea protein. 
um, and I literally restart them. Um, I mean, I've had people in wheelchairs um, get up and walk for the first time on doing this, so it's critical. So be aggressive on on uh, limiting their their supplements, but you've got to work with their doctor, and you've got to convince them that in order to get an understanding of where they are and how to treat them and to save them money also, because a lot of times they're taking way too many supplements, um, just start them on sublingual methylcobalamin first, and you ramp up uh, every three days, so and you get up to 5,000 units if you can of uh, 5,000 um, micrograms or 5 milligrams of, of methylcobalamin, but you ramp up. So kids, I'll give them just a, you know 500 micrograms to start and uh, make sure it's sublingual and, uh, you know, again, you ramp up every three days, you double the dose. So if you give them 500, give them 1,000. If you give them 1,000, give them 2,000. And you do it every three days. And if they're improving, 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 keep going. If they're not improving or they feel like crap right after the first dose, you've got, you've got to order testing if they're not doing well after the first dose. Okay. Um, so just keep ramping up to that. Once they hit about, i say, a week of that or two weeks of that, um, and they're doing well with it, uh, they can continue with that. And then I add in a sublingual methylcobalamin with sublingual methylfolate. It's a combination product that I use, and I provide, I give them half a tablet sublingually, along with the sublingual methylcobalamin, if the methylcobalamin sublingually is doing well. Or if they got up just to 1,000 sublingual methylcobalamin, and that was all they could handle, then I cease the sublingual methylcobalamin by itself, and I... Um, give them half of the sublingual methylcobalamin methylfolate supplement, and I do that, and I ramp that up every few days, uh, keeping an eye on symptoms and make sure they're improving. And I do this across the board with all mutations. Um, the 1298AC with the one mutation, the heterozygous mutation, I only give them half a tablet of the combination methylcobalamin methylfolate. They don't need any more than that, in my opinion, um, typically. Um, then I give them a multi with uh, methylfolate, uh, absolutely no uh, folic acid in any of your supplements. Do not give them that. Um, some people, again, cannot handle the multivitamin, um, so you don't give it to them. Uh, I did not show a probiotic on here, probiotic, and I also didn't show vitamin D3. Those are absolute no-brainers. Um, probiotic and D3 should be for everybody, uh, along with the fish oil and krill oil. I mean, those are for everybody. Just not enough space here. So you got to make sure that they are on all of those. But again, one supplement at a time, okay? Uh, most of these people are stressed out and they're uh, really high oxidant status. So um, I give them electrolytes and vitamin C and uh, I mix that all together in what I call MTHFR aid. It's on mthfr.net. You can read about it. Um, but I put that on almost for everybody and they do really well, except for those who may be having CVS mutations. Um, you got to be careful with the electrolyte drink because of the sulfur in it. Um, but electrolytes are critical. Um, and then I add in the B6 and the B2 and the TMG for the 6, 7, 7 variants if after they do well on the methylcobalamin and methylfolate for a few weeks. And then again, you're ramping up one at a time. And I usually stop the sublingual methylfolate, methylcobalamin at that point. Um, you may want to keep them on the sublingual methylcobalamin by itself, but again, every person's different especially if they have COMT or MAO-A. Okay. Um, for the 677 homozygous, uh, get them on natokinase or baby aspirin. Um, consider uh, warfarin or Levinox for those who have clotting disorders. Factor V laden is pretty common, commonly seen um, as a tag-along um, bleeding disorder or a clotting disorder, I should say. Um, 677, one copy, uh, just vitamin E and fish oil, unless there's, again, clotting risks in their family, then... Uh, perhaps natokinase for baby aspirin. Unfortunately, there's not very much good research on natokinase. There should be because it works so damn well eliminating fibrin levels. But, uh, you know, it's CYA. Uh, use baby aspirin. Um, and 1298C, you may need hydroxycobalamin. Um, you know, I just, it's a question mark. I haven't tried it on them yet. Um, but it's just something to consider. Oh, I know why I put it that there. Um, hydroxycobalamin, supposedly hydroxycobalamin works better at reducing levels of peroxynitrate um, and nitric oxide. That I need to further evaluate. Um, 
and understand how that's connected. But I just put it there for you guys. Maybe you can research yourselves and tell me, educate me on that. Um, the compound heterozygous, um, the vitamin E and fish oil, again, to help reduce the, the clotting risk um, with the MTHFR enzyme uh, 677 variant. Okay. And just so you guys know, I'm compound heterozygous. I have one copy of 677 and one 1298C, and I had no idea until two months ago. <laughs> pretty funny. I've been specializing in this, and here I am with this mutation. So I'm doing pretty well. Um, so one nutrient at a time, small amount, every three days. Side effect or feeling ill, cease that supplement or back the dose off. Okay? Um, potassium, uh, you know, there's a... Independent researcher, Rich, uh, he does a ton of research, and he uses uh, potassium with great success um, when he gets side effects from methylfolate and methylcobalamin. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. The only thing I can think of is typically when you have side effects, it's an acidic process, and so you want to alkalinize your body so you can take a, um, you know, tri salts or um, uh, some type of sodium bicarbonate to help. Um, reduce the side effects, um, you know, supplement neutralize is something that I use. Uh, it's got potassium and sodium in it, and that seems to really help a lot. And let's talk about that now. Uh, side effects commonly seen with methylfolate. <laughs> Similar to the things that you're trying to fix. This looks like a drug ad. Side effects, uh, methylfolate medications and supplements. You've got muscle pain, irritability, anxiety, depression, joint pain, nausea, headache, insomnia, seizures, vomiting, stomach pain, sweating, herxing, rashing, and palpitating. So not good. And some of these can be caused mainly because you know, you're over supplementing with methylfolate. And as we discussed earlier, if you're over supplementing with methylfolate, you have the potential to aggravate an existing COMT, MAO-A, um, or CBS mutation. And uh, you know, you gotta start slow. You don't know what mutations are lurking in your patient or yourself. So start slow and avoid these things. Uh, I've had clients tell me that uh, they've been to the ER. Thankfully, I haven't sent anybody to the ER because I'm very careful. Um, I go really slowly and they get better. Um, dealing with side effects from methylfolate, what do you do? Patient comes to you and they're, they call you and like, my kid is breaking windows. Seriously? Happens? What do I do? Give them niacin. Give them potassium. You stop the methylfolate. You stop the methylcobalamin. And you can also give them some liposomal curcumin uh, known as Mariba. The Mariba form is, is uh, way more absorbable than the um, other standard stuff of curcumin. So get the liposomal form of Mariba. Um, get them on the, about 125 milligrams of, of potassium. And give them about 50 milligrams of, of niacin. Uh, time to release so they don't flush. And you will be the hero. Okay? That will take care of the side effects, typically. So, what's the importance of not taking too much methylfolate? This is an awesome picture. Uh, I wish I drew it, but um, primarypsychiatry.com, they've got a good article there. Um, so, in the blood, methylfolate goes into CNS with the, MT with the assistance of the MTHFR enzyme along with biopterin and the enzymes of tryptophan hydroxylase and tyrosine hydroxylase, you make these neurotransmitters, right? Right. But what if you got COMT? Uh-oh, you got an elevation of norepinephrine and dopamine. What if you got MAO-A? You got elevation of serotonin. You got serotonin syndrome. Not a good situation. Careful with your L-methylfolate, folks. Taper up, okay? but at least you know how to handle the, the side effects with your niacin, nicotinic acid, not niacinamide, nicotinic acid, time release. And you've also got potassium or sodium bicarbonate. And you've also got Mariva form of turmeric. And you also got stopping the damn supplement. So we talked about here, excessive methylfolate plus biopterin can increase norepinephrine levels, causing increased anxiety, palpitations, and fits and anger, rage. Um, excessive methylfolate can also utilized biopterin causing an increase in proxy nitrate and nitric oxide. And I think this is why you're getting muscle pain, soreness, and headaches, and neurological tingling and uh, other issues um, because of excessive methylfolate. Um, you know, we're using up all the biopterin, and therefore the biopterin is not able to process the uh, proxy nitrate. 
zero tolerance to methylcobalamin and methylfolate? Ah, did you do all the steps? Did you do all the um, multifaceted approach? You deal with the diet? You deal with the gut? Um, did you remove the folic acid antagonists? Did you get rid of folic acid supplements? Did you get rid of the niacin? Did you, um, you got compliance in your patient? You got food allergies? You got gut disorders? You got H. pylori? Um, you know, these are things that you got to address before you just jump to prescribing methylfolate in your patients. You got to do the foundational work first. I know a lot of patients are gung-ho to take your methylfolate, but you can't take the methylfolate sometimes until you get the foundation going first. Sometimes it takes quite a bit of work before you do that. Believe me, I've learned the hard way on that, so I'm letting you know now, okay? So do the foundational step first. Increase their methylation by reducing the methylation utilage um, of, of uh, you know, the toxic environment and their um, imbalanced gut flora. I mean, all these things are utilizing methylation like crazy. So reduce their taxing on the methylation systems and... Uh, they're not going to need their MTHFR enzyme working as much um, because they're balancing methylation on their own through lifestyle dietary changes and their digestion improvements. Um, and I would also do lab testing. Um, I wouldn't jump to further genetic testing right off the gate. I would do the lab testing that we talked about earlier, um, you know, the proxy nitrate and ammonia, the taurines, amino acids, and, and so on. Um, the same goes for methylcobalamin. Maybe switch to hydroxycobalamin. And uh, if they improve on that, then you're probably dealing with a COMT or MAO-A mutation. Okay. List of don'ts. Huh. Don't prescribe high methyl dose or high dose methylfolate without tapering up mass side effect potential or hospitalization. Giving methylfolate first instead of methylcobalamin or hydroxycobalamin. You're going to potentially cause methyl trapping and you're not doing your uh, patient any service because you're going to increase uh, all these neurotransmitters um, significantly and you're not going to be increasing your glutathione which they which they really need so give them the methylcobalamin first being aggressive prescribing multiple supplements right away to be a hero to get rid of all their symptoms boy that was me when I first started I looked at all these things oh, I can give them this and this and this man I backfired uh, don't do it um, one at a time don't do potent therapies as coffee enemas or saunas or Epsom salts baths without first doing the foundational work. Please get into those once they're starting to feel good. Then ease into them. Ease into them. First signs of, of not feeling good in the sauna, they're out of there. Uh, Epsom salt baths, they're out of there. First sign. Uh, if you're guessing after the foundational work is done, you're giving them the supplements, they're not working, uh, they're not doing very well, get the lab testing going. Blame everything on MTHFR. Oh, boy. Uh, patients do this all the time, and the doctors too. You, you see the spectra cell test come back, and you're like, oh, sweet. This person's got MTHFR. Now I can get them better. I can give them methylfolate, methylcobalamin, and follow this protocol, and everything's hunky-dory. No, not always. It's critical. It's absolutely critical, definitely. But you can't put everything on the MTHFR, especially recurrent miscarriages. Recurrent miscarriages, there's an article on MTHFR.net highly recommend that you read it. Um, there's a lot of good information in that article um, about recurrent miscarriages and has nothing to do with MTHFR. Um, measuring homocysteine as a guide to therapeutic guidepost for your MTHFR treatment, bogus, because there's other routes to reduce homocysteine. Which therapy is used for MTHFR? Colonics, saunas, castor oil packs, coffee enemas, Epsom salt baths, rebounding is great for lymphatic flow. So is dry skin brushing, hot yoga, uh, increasing flexibility and circulation. Plus, it's great for the mind. Breathing, uh, critically important. Uh, vicious cycle, when you're anxious, you don't breathe. And, it, and then when you don't breathe, you get anxious. Uh, 